Hey friends, my name is Jake. Welcome to Canadian Cutting Edge. Very brief introduction. We're going to take a look at the Spyderco Stretch 2 with ZDP-189 steel. This is much higher end than I usually review. This video comes thanks of Andrew. Andrew loaned this knife to me. He emailed me and asked me if I'd like to review it and he uh, graciously accepted covering all the costs involved of mailing it back and forth. So Andrew, thank you very much. Without any further ado, let's get to the tabletop and take a good look at it. Okay, let's get started. First thing we're gonna do is the size comparison with the Ontario Rat 1. Line up those pivot pins. It's a very similar size knife, but even less than the Ontario Rat 1 is how much cutting edge you get by almost a quarter of an inch. And usually I'm complaining that the Ontario Rat's got too little cutting edge for its size. That's one of my main cons about this knife. The cutting edge to handle ratio, I think it's way off. There's just a whole lot of handle for how much cutting edge you have. My hands are into the extra large range and if I reach and I'm at the back, the handle's right there. Look how much more handle there is yet. Of course, that can be a good thing. Maybe you want extra reach. And if you sneak up this way, then you can get close to the cutting edge. So it's all a personal taste kind of thing. It just seems out of balance for me. Like that handle looks too big for the size of knife that you get. The blade, what do we got? I'm gonna call this like a stretched drop point since it is the stretch. Uh, the second generation of the stretch. Full flat grind, reasonable sharpening on here. I'll tell you later on about the grind angles and everything. There's no sharpness toil, which I seriously dislike because sharpening this thing at home, it's going to be easy to make a big mess of it in that region right there. Because how can I sharpen exactly to that spot where the factory sharpened it to? It's a little difficult. If you've got a sharpness toy, you've got some play, you've got some room to, you know, get it right. Got your typical Spyderco hole, and the plunge goes right through the middle of that hole. We've got a great big thumb riser on this. They do have the Stretch 2 version that doesn't have this funky hump, so you can get both either of those. Uh, by the way, here's a picture of all the different ones that Spyderco lists on their website, and those are the prices from their site as well. Of course, there's some sprint runs as well, but those are the standard ones. So you can get it in, I think, four different types of steel if you count the sprint runs. This is the highest end steel. It's the ZDP-189. The Rockwell on that is usually around 65, 63, 65, sometimes even up to 67, depending on what the manufacturer wants to do. I'm not sure how hard Spyderco does their ZDP-189. We've got a half and half forward choil and a nice ramp there. They both have the best jimping in the market. That's one thing that Spyderco does better than anybody else, except for people that copy the same jimping. I don't know if they did this jimping first or not. It's a nice fine jimping, which gives a lot of grip without being hot. That's the best way to make jimping grippy without being hot in the hand. So I very much like that jimping. And this half and half choil means your finger can be uh, having its power resting right here on the handle scale, which is nice and rounded, very comfortable. Again, they make the best forward choils in the market. It's a lockback system. We've got phosphor bronze washers, two very thin phosphor bronze washers, one on each side. And um, the owner of this sent it to me. He said he didn't use it at all. So... Let me show you, if I push the lock in, it wants to fall. But that also means there's some blade play side to side. Not just flex because of the thin liners in the FRN, but there's actually a little bit of play. If you tighten it up enough to get rid of that play, then it no longer freely drops. So you decide how tight you want to make your pivot pin. Uh, talking about the lock back, it's got the uh, Typical lockback, I like this little divot that they've milled into there. Makes it easy to get your thumb on there and get just the right pressure on the right spot. 
the uh, spring that's inside here is just the right tension. Spyderco does pay attention to some details very, very well. And it doesn't hold hard enough to stop you from opening the knife. In fact, that back spring is weak enough that I can make a, a arm and wrist flick hard enough to make this blade deploy. Which uh, means, technically, it would fail uh, Canada Border Services Agency's centrifugal knife test. And uh, it could get confiscated for that reason. Usually lockback knives, you know, aren't so smooth that you can actually deploy the blade from a hard wrist flick. I can't do it on the table here, but I have to be standing up to make it come out. Uh, but maybe you can hear it if you listen really carefully. So that was just coming out just a little bit and then bouncing back. Now they did make it properly that there is a, not a stop pin, but there's a stop on there. So when you close the knife, the cutting edge does not hit the back. So that's well made. Blade alignment, it's almost in the middle. It's a little bit on this side. That's just the way it is. Uh, the show side here, we've got pins with just the uh, sort of button sides of them right there. And they're sunk in. I like this idea. I very much dislike the execution. I'd much rather have it be flat right here so that it's flush with the surface of the handle instead of being a little corner where, you know, like I say with button screws on G10, you know, it's just a spot where lint can catch and stuff. So I much prefer Civivi's flat top screws. And these are T6 screws. They're made quite well, but I don't like T6 screws. I'd much prefer a T8. There's a T8 on the pivot pin here, but it's also one of those sunken button screws as well. So there's that, the handle. This is the classic, very grippy Spyderco handle, again, without being hot. You've got these directional um, little ramps with the little divots in them on either side. It just really works well when you're holding the knife, your, your fingers get in there, and even the flat of your uh, back of your knuckles right here it gets in a little bit, and it's very comfortable and grippy and very sure grip. We've got a four-way pocket clip. It's a, both up and down on the show side and up and down on the working side. I'm not that fond of this pocket clip. I much prefer Spyderco's wire clip. And uh, they could have done a wire clip with the FRN, but uh, you know they chose this clip. The lanyard hole, I really don't like the lanyard hole to be that deep into a knife. You put paracord through there and it just it just gets big in the hand. Thankfully, if you're on a forward choil, it's all hanging out right at the back. And even if you sneak up a little bit, it's not too bad. But I've always thought it's very, very weird to have the hole through the pocket clip. And I'd much rather the lanyard hole was further back. On these kind of spider coats, I prefer to carry it tipped down because then it hides in the pocket a little bit better. Let's demonstrate how it goes in. It's got a nice spoon with the flat top. Functionally, it works perfect to go into the pocket. You've got an inch or 2.4 centimeters of the knife sticking out of your pocket. You can even see the blade there. If you don't mind that, then it's a good pocket clip. I don't like that much sticking out, but it's very grippy when you go to grab it with all the, the bumps from these screws and stuff and the texture on the back side to pull the knife out, no problem. The handle edges are nicely rounded. So that's again what I was talking about, very comfortable in the hand. Let's show you some pictures of it taken apart. So you can see that they could have done more skeletonizing in there. And more skeletonizing would have helped it a little bit. You can see where the spring is at the back there and the D-shaped pivot pin. That's quite good. I talked about the um, more skeletonizing because the balance point is way back here. I guess I could turn it this way. I prefer the balance point to be closer up here. I like it where my finger um, grabs. is. It's close to that, but I think they could have skeletonized it a little bit more and put the balance point forward a little bit. It's okay, but it's just not great that way. 
Okay, I've sharpened it now, and you can see there's a nice mirror edge if I move it back and forth like that. I want to show you a problem with knives sharpened in factories. They sharpen them on a slack belt usually, uh, well, sometimes on a belt that's got a backing, but it's a belt moving across. Take a look at the part closest to the shoulder of the knife. That's the shiny white part. The dark part, uh, just because the way shadows are working, is the factory sharpening. Now look at here. It's sharpened by me almost all the way across. Now here it's just a little bit sharpened by me, and here it's sharpened all the way across. This distance here is about one inch, actually a little bit less than an inch. I'm using a two inch wide stone so I can put as even pressure on it as I can, and it's a hard flat stone. So clearly when it was sharpened at the factory, the grinding angle was changing here. It's one of the reasons why I really dislike factory sharpening, and this is a 150 US dollar knife. So it certainly happens on low budget knives as well, but it happens on every knife. So every, you know, small custom home shop knife maker and every factory that uses this kind of sharpening method has this kind of problem. If Mora can t sell knives that cost 15 US dollars that have a perfectly straight sharpening all the way along because they use a robotic process, I'm sure other factories can do the same. It's time to use precision knife maker companies, uh, knife makers and companies. Precision is what will get more respect from your customers and therefore get more sales. At least I think so. And it will frustrate us when we're trying to sharpen knives a whole lot less because this is frustrating. This is a fairly hard steel. So it's going to take me a while to get it sharp. And I reiterate, no sharpener's toil. This is going to be hard to finish doing that right here. You can see right here how that spot and the edge very different on the uh, way it was sharpened. That's because when they start at this edge, they're pushing in harder and then they start moving across. They have to do a plunge into the sharpening media and then they start going across. And that's why invariably they remove more steel right there. And it's just going to be hard to match or clean up. It took me about four times as long as normal to sharpen the knife simply because there was no sharpness choil and I wanted to keep it a very nice crisp edge there. I think I did a pretty good job. Time now to go over all the sizes and dimensions on this knife. The weight 106 grams 3.7 ounces. Factory sharpness 130 bess. That's a very tiny bit better than average. Average is around 140. The length of the cutting edge, 75.2 millimeters, 2.96 inches. Length of the blade, tip to the handle, 87.4 millimeters, 3.44 inches. The thickness of the blade, 2.84 millimeters, which is 0.112 of an inch, just under an eighth. The blade depth, the widest point is right there and that is 33.3 millimeters, 1.31 inches. How thick was it behind the grind? 0.56 millimeters, 22 thousandths of an inch. That's a little bit too thick. It's partly because they wasted a bunch of steel. If you take a look at the close up, they should have been able to get the edge fairly close to where the end of the steel was. Instead, it's moved back about a millimeter. The angles. I didn't work out the averages. I'll put the average on the screen. This side, it started at 17 degrees, went to 14.4 degrees, and then ended at 18 and a half degrees. This side started at 24.7 degrees, went to 25.4 degrees, and then up to 26.6 degrees. So it's sharpened as poorly as the very lowest low budget knives are sharpened. It's because humans do it. The handle length is 120 millimeters, 4.72 inches. The grip area, a bit under 10 centimeters or four inches. But if you add this in, it's about 12 and a half centimeters or 4.9 inches, almost five inches of room on this thing. Great for huge hands. The thickness of the handle, 
11.2 millimeters, 0.441 of an inch. The handle depth, so within the grip area, it's widest right here. 31.4 millimeters, 1.24 inches. When the knife is closed, the widest point is right there. 42.8 millimeters, 1.68 inches. Total length of this knife is 207.5 millimeters. All right, there's the dimensions and all that stuff. Let's just finish off with my thoughts on this thing. Oh, I don't remember if I went over the price. $154 at White Mountain Knives. Take off 10% with coupon code CCE. If you want uh, the same knife, but with VG10 to save some money, you can save about $53, something like that. Uh, 52 and a half. $101.50 for it with VG10. But like I said, there's a number of other steels that you can get it in. And you can also get it in G10 in Canada. With the same steel, the only difference is the G10, you pay an extra $100. <laughs> That's at Blades Canada. So, uh, yeah, it's expensive in Canada to get a, a, what I think is a small upgrade. Okay, pros and cons. To summarize quickly, a very grippy handle. That's a very well-designed handle in terms of how it feels in the hand. Its comfort to grip factor is excellent. I really like that. The action's very smooth. Like I said, you just undo the lock and the blade falls. Uh, so the jimping, very nice. They do the best jimping in the market on the steel. Solid lockup. There's no blade play up and down. And, you know, there's a little bit of side to side if you make it as loose as I as it was from the factory, so it just drops. It slices and cuts quite well. It's a very good blade shape, good design, nice full flat grind. I wish it was thinner behind the grind though. Nice distal taper, I didn't talk about that yet. The blade gets thinner as you go along the length of the blade and it starts right at the beginning. So it's thinning all the way along instead of just thinning on the last inch or so. I like that. But the thickness behind the grind gets thicker as you go to the end of the blade. I don't like that. The uh, recessed button screws, you know, this thing's barely been tested. I didn't uh, carry it for an awful lot of days. I didn't do all the carrying tests, but I did the cutting tests. And you can see in the edges of these recesses where the screw heads on either end go in, you know, it's starting to collect lint. I just don't like that. No sharpness choil. I don't like that. The handle to cutting edge ratio, I think is quite a bit off. I don't really like that. And I'm not that fond of this pocket clip. It's, it's a functional pocket clip, all right, but an inch sticking out, yeah, I'm not too fond of that. The lanyard hole, I don't use lanyards that much, but I don't like the placement of the lanyard hole either. I think it should be down here where this screw is. You know, change where the screw layout is or something, but that's where it is. And then the blade length. See the blade length? The handle comes out quite a bit extra after the tip of the blade. That's part of the handle to blade ratio question. Most knives have it quite a bit closer. And I like it that way. So what do I think of this knife? It's outside of my budget. So I wouldn't buy it, uh, even regardless of all the issues that I found with it, of, of my personal likes and dislikes. Some of those things are just facts of pros and cons. A lot of it, though, is personal preference. Like the personal preference of the cutting edge to the handle ratio. There's no science saying that one's better than the other. It's just, I like them to be closer to, you know, if this is four inches, I want this to be five inches or less. So it's a decent knife if that's what you're looking for. And there's some really good things about it. Like I said, I wish every company would try to match this jimping. It's probably the best thing that Spyderco has uh, done. I've seen some knives have it, but uh, Spyderco does the nice jimping pretty much all the time. I think it's too much money for what you get. You know, it is made in Japan. That does cost more money. 
but I think it's overpriced for what you get. But that's just my opinion as a guy who is very focused on budget knives and trying to get the very best bang for your buck. Thanks for watching my video. Thanks for liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing. And remember, friends, I got to send this knife back to the owner. And cut towards your chum, not your thumb. Bye for now.